Hello, Mike. Thank you. And thank you for everyone who's listening. Special thanks to those who have earned their, <laughs> their survivor's badge. This is study number 63, and not many more to go now. So thank you for listening, and thank you for being part of this. And we really do appreciate any comments you have to make. Uh, we're not we're not touchy or nervous here, so be bold. Tell us what you think, what you would like, and uh, we'll see if we can accommodate you. So, the, my title for this particular session is Spontaneous Moral Originality. Shall I say that again? Spontaneous Moral Originality. And that's borrowed. That title is borrowed from the writings of Oswald Chambers, and we'll have more to say about that a little later on. So here we are, coming to you courtesy of me, Ron Bailey, at BibleBase.com, and Mike Coles from NewLifeRadio.co.uk in Exeter. And we've been working over these 60-odd studies now together to provide what we've called a, a revisiting to the book I wrote about 10 years ago called The Better Covenant. So the title of this series has been The Better Covenant Re uh, Revisited. I was going to say resisted then. Uh, definitely don't resist the new covenant. This is The Better Covenant Revisited. And by all means, the book is still uh, available on sale. Just go to Kindle, look for my name and the title of the book, The Better Covenant, and you'll find it there. Thank you for listening. Thank you for reading. Thank you for being part of this little company as we've tried to examine these things together. Introduction. I'm told by those who ought to know that I had to learn to walk three times. Most folks manage to do this just once, but my slow learning was caused by recurring bouts of tonsillitis, which laid me low. Now, most of us take walking for granted until something goes wrong. Some years ago, I tore the cruciate ligament in my knee, and then he locked in severe pain. I suppose in all the years that preceded it, I had never given 30 seconds thought to my knee geometry and cruciate ligaments. When things are working well, we hardly notice them. In the initial learning process, our attention to what we are doing can become intense. You see a child who's just learning to work and just look at the concentration that goes into it. <laughs> but once we've mastered the technique, it just flows. Step by step. Walking is a word that you would not usually spend time trying to define. After all, everyone knows what walking is. I'm told that anatomists would argue that it is a highly complicated process involving more than 200 muscles, but to the user, once initiated, it's just a simple process. First, you decide where you want to be. And then you lift one foot and reposition it closer to your destination. Once you've Completed this first step, you just do it again with the other foot. And as a child, you learned that to take two steps at once is likely to cause a crash. It's a skill that doesn't give much room for sophisticated variety. The simpler we keep it, the less likely we are to fall on our faces. Perhaps that's why the scriptures constantly use the idea of walking for the way in which we continue what we have begun in receiving Christ. This is where we were last time, if you remember. We began with Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6, where Paul, writing to these Christians that he knows of through the testimony of Epaphras, says, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Now, some modern translations prefer to translate the word as live, but I think this confuses the picture as the scriptures clearly distinguish between living and walking. Galatians 5 and verse 25 says, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So the idea of walking as a picture is of the steady step-by-step -step pattern of daily life. It's a favourite of Paul. 
He uses the idea almost 40 times in his writings. Usually the word he uses is the simple word for walking around, but occasionally he uses another word which has the sense of a more deliberate action. The idea there is of taking clear, specific steps, the sense of deliberate choice towards a destination. He uses this word to describe Abraham's deliberate steps of faith. And again in the verse quoted earlier, walking in the Spirit, is not a gentle ramble, but it is the making of deliberate choices that show itself in the taking of definite steps. Paul encourages his rulers in Colossae to keep to the pattern in which they began. Keep it simple. The verse could be translated simply as having received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in him. It's just the next logical process. It makes a simple point even simpler. We cannot continue, of course, until we have begun. We cannot walk in the Spirit unless we have received Christ Jesus the Lord. And this may explain the struggles that some young converts have and the different methodologies that we have devised to make their way easier. The point is this that I'm trying to make. It is not possible to live in a new covenant way unless we have been brought into that covenant. No amount of praying, Bible reading, fellowshipping or discipling can alter that simple fact. It is the same basic truth that Jesus declared to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 and verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Someone who read this book said that he liked this next statement I'm going to make. I think more than all the others in the book. So just let me read what I've got in my notes here. The Old Covenant was really designed for the old man. And the New Covenant is designed for the new man. The New Covenant functions in an entirely different way to the old. The old was good when it was used for its proper purpose. It says, Paul writing to Timothy, chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, and he says, But the law is good. Now we must never say anything different to that. The law is good. But Paul adds a qualifying statement. He says, For we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, I won't go any farther. The list continues, but we have enough here to make an observation. The law was not designed, and this is really so important, it was not designed to address individual transgressions, but to expose the nature behind those transgressions. I want to talk about sinless perfection. Oh, help, you say. <laughs> Someone once asked um, George Campbell Morgan, because he used to say that although he was ordained as a Congregationalist, in his heart he was a Methodist. And he once was asked this question, do you believe in perfection? And I don't know what answer the question I was expecting, but Campbell Morgan said, Of course I do. What do you believe in? Imperfection? Let me ask this question. Does one dance make me a dancer? I'm holding in my hand here a bronze medal. It's the only award I think I've ever received in my life. It's for old time dancing, and it says I've completed the course, and on the back of it is inscribed Ronald Bailey, the 24th of June, 1956. I was 14 years old. I never went back. I've never done any dancing since. So does, am I still a dancer? Does one sin make me a sinner? 
The law, as Paul explains here, was intended to show the exceeding sinfulness of sin, and in that role it still has a limited purpose, but the law was not made for a righteous person. Now, I want to say something which is a little bit complicated, and if you want to dig deeper into this, you can go even more complicated, or I hope maybe understand it on another level altogether. But there is a construction in Biblical Greek that draws attention to the character of the person rather than to the act that he has just performed. I will try to keep this simple, but it's created by putting a definite article, that's the Greek, Bible Greek doesn't have an a. So by putting the definite article the in front of a present participle of a verb, oh, help you say, I'll go and make a cup of coffee. Okay, a participle is one of those words that ends in ing. So if we were going to say uh, believe, and then we said believing, well, believing is kind of a present participle of a verb. And there's a construction in Greek which can put a definite article in the nominative case in front of a present participle of a verb. And it creates something like the believing and there's a gap. But Greek does this from time to time. We need to add the word person to complete the sense. So if we were using this Greek construction, we would translate it, if we were translating it literally, the believing one. That would add the word person to complete the sense. So we have the believing one, or more appropriately in English, the believer. Now you can dig deeper if you want to, and I think some of you who've got a little bit of an idea of what this is all about, you may enjoy doing that. But I'm just going to leave it simply as that. So a believer, in this Bible sense of using an article with the, in the nominative and a present participle. A believer, then, is not someone who believed once upon a time at a particular date in a revival crusade. A believer is a person whose lifestyle is characterized by the fact that he is a believing one. He may suffer deep trials, but his underlying characteristic is that he is a believer. The effect of the new covenant in giving a new heart and spirit and God's own spirit coming within to take up residence is that the essential nature of the person is changed. The old heart of stone is removed and a new heart of flesh replaces it. The characteristic of this person is that he is no longer a sinner, characteristically, but a saint, one of God's people. He may act uncharacteristically in an act of sin, but this is against his nature and does not mean his character has changed. What do you make of this verse from 1 John? We know that whoever is born of God does not sin. Oh, I can almost hear the sighs. <laughs> this brings us face to face with two very awkward passages of scripture in John's first letter. They produce a profound sense of unease in many Christians who read them. They are so absolute in the way that they seem to express a particular truth that many have just given up trying to include them in their theology. Here's the first one. 1 John chapter 3 verse 6. Whoever abides in him does not sin. This is the New King James Version. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Now, that is pretty black and white, isn't it? Now, you're familiar with Joan's black and whiteness, I hope. It's either, John is always either or. There's never many, any middle ground. Whoever abides in him does not sin, but whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. And the second verse in John's first letter is much the same. This is 1 John chapter 5. And verse 18, and John writes, We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. Now these are two amazing statements. 
And we need to be careful that we don't take statements like this and say, well, here on the one hand is my experience, and here on the other hand is this Bible testimony. I will bring my understanding of it down to the level of my experience so that I can make sense of this statement. You must not do that. What you must do is look at your experience in the light of the biblical revelation and saying, what is the significance of this gap? Is there something I need to learn? Is there something I need to experience? Is there something in which I'm lacking? If we put both these statements together, read them again, 1 John 3 and verse 6, whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. And then 1 John 5 and verse 18, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who is born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. So these verses certainly need to be unpacked carefully because if we put both of them together we find that someone who is born of God and who abides in him does not sin is that the end of the story they do need to be unpacked carefully if we're not going to damage the contents so please bear with me if we proceed slowly it's a well established pattern of interpretation of written documents that we take our initial understanding from the things said first, and then, if necessary, adjust our understanding later in the light of later information. This simply means that we need to go farther back in John's first letter to be ready to understand the later statements. Throughout John's first letter, we get instances of that definite article in the nominative followed by a present participle effect. We said that this is the equivalent in English of putting the letters er onto the stem of the verb to create words like believer or dancer or painter or bus driver or whatever. This construction is drawing our attention to the character rather than to a single instance. The word that John uses in these verses is the word poyo, which is a general purpose word which means to make or to do. It's translated by various words in our modern translations, make, do, practice, commit, and others. In these verses, it's used with that article in the nominative plus the present participle. He is speaking of characteristic action, not single events. In the first instance, he speaks of those who characteristically do the will of God, and the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who is, let me alter it a little bit, he who is characteristically doing the will of God, he who is the doer of the will of God, abides forever. In the second instance, he speaks of those who characteristically practice righteousness, that same construction. Definite article in the nominative preceding uh, the present participle. 1 John 2, verse 29. If you know that he is righteous, and you, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Now remember that Paul, not John now, but Paul, has informed Timothy that the law was not designed for a righteous man. Here, John says that anyone born of God is characterized by his righteous behavior. In the third instance, he speaks of someone who characteristically commits sin. If we want to add the ER on, these we might call sinners. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. It's putting that poyo, poyo word in there again. So whoever commits sin commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. In the fourth instance, he says that we are not to be de deceived, but that anyone who characteristically behaves in a righteous way, that person is righteous. In 1 John chapter 3 verse 7, he says, little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, 
just as he is righteous. He follows this by stating the opposite truth, that anyone who characteristically sins, literally the sinning one, is of the devil. 1 John chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. In the sixth instance, he declares that the characteristic behaviour of a person shows whose children they are. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 10. In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. It's in this context of the continual repetition of the one idea that John's statements of whoever abides in him does not sin, whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him, and we know that whoever is born of God does not sin, need to be understood. John is not proclaiming a sinless perfection in which sin has become impossible to one who is born of God. He is simply declaring that the characteristic pattern of behavior of the regenerate is that they are, in the language of Ezekiel, being caused to walk in God's statutes, keeping his judgments and doing them. That's Ezekiel 36, verse 37. All as a result of being given a new heart to replace the old heart, of being given a new spirit, and having God's indwelling spirit come to become resident in the heart. There's another theme in John's letter which is equally important and it's equally absolute. The little phrase here, the same anointing teaches you concerning all things. But truth for John is not just factual accuracy. It's rather a white, right way of understanding, of seeing, of living. 1 John chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. In our Christian experience, we may well meet with factual inaccuracy or doctrinal error at work in our lives and the lives of others. And John is mindful of this, but his references to the Spirit ensuring truth is not to be limited to wrong ideas. It must also include wrong living. He says that they have an anointing that they know or recognize all things but he turns them for that instruction not to written codes of law, but to an inworking of God's Spirit who will teach them how to live. 1 John chapter 2, verse 24 to 27 Therefore let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught, you will abide in him. This is another of John's absolute statement that leave modern minds reeling. Lines that are more used to a more gentle consensus. People who prefer to think not in terms of revolution, but of evolution. Regeneration is not evolution. It's revolution. It's a new paradigm. It's all things passing away and all things becoming new. Let's see if we can understand it a little better if we contrast it with the Old Covenant. You remember that we've said this frequently, that the first thing that Jeremiah thirty-one thirty-one tells us about the Old Covenant, sorry, about the New Covenant, is, you ought to be able to repeat this with me now, the first thing that Jeremiah tells us in Jeremiah thirty-one thirty-one about the New Covenant is that it is not like the Old Covenant. 
The word new, every time you find it in front of the word covenant, it is implying not a development, but a contrast. So, the persistence of Scripture in insisting that in this new era, truth is written within, on the heart, is conspicuous. It's no longer an outward expression written on tablets of stone that will be the guide to righteousness, but an indwelling spirit whose continuing presence forms the likeness of Christ in the heart. It will cause them to walk in his statutes and to keep his judgments and do them. The righteous requirements of the law are thus satisfied in the righteous lives of God's new covenant people. But the handwriting of that law is taken away. In one sense, this new covenant people does not keep the Ten Commandments. It fulfills the greater law that was behind the Sinai expression. The Sinai law was given specially to the Sinai covenant people of God. And several of its points were only possible when church and state, I mean, by that I mean the people of Israel and the nation of Israel, were one and the same thing. The honouring of parents held the promise of a long life in Eretz Israel, the promised land. The Sabbath could only be kept precisely in a territory that was itself committed to the keeping of the Sabbath. Sabbath keeping outside of the land would always be a compromise. The Ten Commandments themselves were addressed specifically to a people with a specific history. Exodus 20, verse 1, And God spake all these words, saying, I am Jehovah thy God, who brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. As we have seen earlier, way back in chapter 2, the Sinai law was a unique application of universal law given to a specific people in a specific context. But the universal law itself still holds true and has its witness as the work of the law written in the hearts of men and women who have no link to the Sinai covenant. Behind the Sinai covenant law was a very simple but profound idea. This is Jesus speaking in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 30. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment and the second is like it. Namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor, neighbor as thyself there is none other commandment greater than these. It was expanded into ten commandments and numerous judgments, but in essence it's very simple. In his epistle to the Galatians, Paul reduces the manwards aspect of the law to a single word. This is Galatians 5 and verse 14. He says, for all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In fact, in the original biblical Greek, you shall love is literally one word. So, the sons then are not under the yoke of the law. The sons are free. While on earth, Christ showed that the prohibitions of the Sinai law were much more comprehensive than had been thought, and that intention was no less a transgression than the outward performance. That is still true. The specific details of the Ten Commandments were something like the way in which a beam of light entering a triangular prism is split into its different parts, but the original beam is seen in the simple but comprehensive statement. Thou shalt love. And then this is Matthew 22, verse 40 now. And then listen what Jesus has to say. He makes this statement. Thou shalt love God above all and your neighbor as yourself. And then he says this. This is such a profound statement that will explain to us the law and the prophets on these two commandments. There are just two commandments. And if you want to reduce them to one, with one word, there's just one. 
thou shalt love. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. We saw earlier that the moment of Christ's public acknowledgement as the Son of God marked a turning point in his life. Up until this time, so far as the record tells us, he was content to live his life within the circle of his family. Luke's Gospel tells us that in his early teenage years his heart stirred to be about his father's work, but it also tells us that under his family's gentle rebuke he returned to Nazareth and was subject to Mary and Joseph. I love this passage of Scripture. It is a wonderful glimpse into those hidden years. The general supposition is that at some time during the 18 years between his visit to the temple and his arrival at John's baptism, Joseph had died and Jesus had taken on the headship of the family. That would certainly have been the pattern and there's no need to challenge it. But it seems that his subjection to Mary may have continued into adult life. We may deduce this from the details of the miracle at the wedding in Cana. It seems that Mary was... I hope I'm not being unkind in saying this. I don't mean any unkindness. It seems that Mary was accustomed to instructing him. At least, as do many fine mothers, pointing him in the right direction. Perhaps his answer surprised her. John 2 and verse 4, Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. The word woman is not quite so stark as it might sound in English, but the point is the same. He was consciously distancing himself from Mary and from a previous pattern of behaviour. Maybe you remember on another occasion his family came seeking him, thinking that he was out of his mind. And he said, who, are, who is my mother and who is my family? You who obey the word of God. So he gently distances himself from Mary. He's not abandoning her, and in fact almost his last words were as he committed her care into the hands of John. Woman, behold thy son, he said. And to John, behold thy mother. Let me, I said I would speak about spontaneous moral originality, didn't I? He was sitting there thinking, oh, we've got away with it. No, here it is. From the moment that he heard the father's voice at Jordan, he never again submitted himself to Mary. He loved her, respected her, made provision for her at his death, but never again would he subject himself to this old order. The words from heaven had declared him to be a son. And from this time he lived as one. The sons, you see, are free. That comes, of course, in Matthew chapter 26. A son lives in fellowship and harmony with his father and does not pattern his life on written rules and regulations. A much-loved writer, by me anyway, <laughs> confused, I know, to some people, has a wonderful phrase for the pattern of life that Christ lived in. He called it spontaneous moral originality. He had a way with words, and if you have dabbled with Oswald Chambers and you find him difficult to understand, stick at it. You'll learn the way he uses his words, and it'll get richer as you go on. So he called this way of Christ's life. I do always, he said, those things that please the Father. He called it spontaneous moral originality. Christ was not acting out a script, nor conforming to an outward law, but his every act pleased his Father. He was spirit-led. Matthew's account of the scene is interrupted by the positioning of a chapter break, and the flow is easily missed, but it goes on to say, and suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased then, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. What an amazing statement this is. My Son, in whom I am well pleased, Jesus was led up by the Spirit 
into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. My, you must expect some measure of this. As God owns you for his son, that statement and that conviction in your heart will be a target for an enemy who more than anything else is the slanderer, the one who wants to slander the character of God and tell you that God cannot do what he's promised for you. The moment of the acknowledgement of sonship was the moment that Jesus became spirit-led in the sense of living independently from the law and its cultural patterns. From this time onwards, he is no longer subject to Mary or to the outward rules of his race. His behaviour sometimes appears erratic and bizarre. It's impossible to guess what he will do next. He is living his life with a spontaneous moral originality. He fulfilled all righteousness, but he did not do so by patterning his life on a series of commandments. He was living the life of a son with a father. Spontaneous moral originality. And brother, sister, it is your birthright. This is how J. N. Darby translate John chapter 1 and verse 14 And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have contemplated his glory a glory as of an only begotten with a father. That's the account you have in the gospel. It's not directly a biography. It is an expression of the glory that was revealed as an only begotten Son with the Father. That unbroken fellowship that comes through so strongly in John's Gospel all the way has to do with relationship and communion. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have contemplated his glory, a glory as of the only begotten with the Father, full of grace and truth. And according to Paul, this pattern of life is what characterizes the life of a son of God. Romans 8 verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Remember, the sons are free. This is a definition of sonship that we hear little of in contemporary Christianity, but it's one of the ways we may recognize those who have the Spirit of Christ. This is the explanation of the occasionally unpredictable behaviour of Paul in the Acts of the Apostles. He is not living his life according to a set of rules, not Sinai rules, not Christian rules. Shall I whisper this? Not even evangelical rules. He is living a life of spontaneous moral originality. I hope this little phrase is going to get into your vocabulary. Ah, but you say, won't this just result in every man doing what's right in his own eyes? Not if all the safeguards are all in place. And it's to those that we must turn next. Next week. So in this chapter we considered the questions of sinless perfection and the anointing. We also introduced Oswald Chambers' phrase, spontaneous moral originality. And we saw that Christ did not live his life according to a script but in daily dependence on the leading of the Spirit. We saw that Paul said that this way of life is what identifies the sons of God. And we saw too that of all the old covenant prophets, they can be condensed into a single idea, thou shalt love. Maybe it's come to your mind that Jesus in his temptation says, A man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, and you have interpreted it, as a reference to the written word of God. Listen, every word that proceeds, present tense, every word that is proceeding from the mouth of God. He lived his life as a result of a conversation, a communion between his father and himself. Oh, he knew the scriptures, and in their right time and moment, he would bring them to bear. But he's hearing the voice of God. Morning by morning, his ear is being opened as a disciple. And he's hearing 
words that he will pass on to those who are weary. May we learn to do the same. So, thank you for listening. And until the same time, same place next week, when we hope you'll join us for what might be the penultimate episode of these studies, the new covenant, the new, the better covenant, <laughs> the better covenant. You'd think I knew the title of this book now, now, wouldn't you? The better covenant revisited. Until then, thank you again for coming. God bless you.